Hello and welcome. Today is Saturday, October the 4th, 2014. This is Paul Sandhu coming to you with another episode of Wake Up and Live Radio. I have on the line with me today Dr. Jim Willie, the golden jackass editor of the Hattrick Letter that is found on his website, goldenjackass.com. Uh, Dr. Jim needs no introduction on this channel, so without further ado, hello and welcome, Jim. Oh, good to be back. Good to be back, Dash. Uh, you know, we're, we're seeing an acceleration of uh, really dangerous things and evidence, I believe, that the bad guys, I mean, they've got a lot of different names, the banker cabal, the, 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 the giant crime syndicate in, out of Wall Street and the castles, but they're, they're bringing out some of their ugliest weapons right now, like uh, war in Ukraine, which is basically an economy killer for Europe. And they're also bringing out their viruses, which is one of my biggest concerns that I've stated for a long time. Uh, you mean like Ebola? Yeah, and people need to realize that this is a fabricated virus, not, not a fabricated story, a fabricated laboratory-based virus that's a new improved virus as a weapon with lots of different human layers put on it, and the patent is owned by the Atlanta Center for Disease Control. Can you imagine why any official agency would have a patent on a virus disease except to profit from it? Yes, that's I was reading somewhere actually that uh... Uh, like Bill Gates and his foundation that is heavily in invested in vaccinations also stands to profit tremendously from uh, growth of these viruses. So yes, uh, uh, these uh, type of uh, psyops are used uh, for many purposes and one of them of course is the money so it always pays to follow the money. Yeah, it pays to follow the money, it pays to follow the passenger lists on the Malaysian Airlines, including the guy who was going to testify against Gates and, Bo and Soros for their development of viruses. So, let's leave that alone now that we've touched it. Okay, Jim, so it's been about uh, five weeks since we last spoke, so what have you, what new information do you have for us? Well, the biggest new item that I have it's more like a development of an of an older item, but uh, it's certainly maturing, and it, it eclipses some other point that I've made. It's it's my item two here. China plans to double the gold price, and to disrupt disrupt the forex derivatives. You know, I have thought for quite a while that we were going to see, and this is you know based on extensive conversations with with my gang and and led by the voice and we thought a year ago that there would be a uh, a mid-sized bank that would go bust an important intermediary bank that would go bust and it would lead to bigger consequences to bigger banks and it it looks based on what we're seeing like with recently with the Banco Espiritu Santo in Portugal they patched it over so any t remember my point, I've made this many times in the last year or more, the big banks are lashed together. They're held together by derivatives and, and mutual, oh, I don't know what to call them, uh, mutual oversight from favor favorable uncles. You know, like they, they're watching over a few big and mid-sized important banks Every big bank has got like a crew of little banks that they watch over to make sure that they're okay. And, and they're using the printing press to redeem the worthless bonds. They're using the printing press to um, pay off on some of the sovereign bonds that are deeply damaged. So when a big bank goes bust, like BES in Portugal did, they, they rushed to the ready. They saw the damage with the... Uh, the insurance, the CDSs, the, the controversy on the uncovered CDSs, the credit default swaps, which act like a, a bond insurance for the bank, bond insurance policy for the bank, for their investors. And the, the derivatives, the CDSs didn't work real well. They did some reform of that. Anyway, the point is that the banks 
can be bailed out very quickly by just the issuance of new money, new aid. And it seems like the banks, the Forex, and the sovereign bonds, you know, like Italian and Spanish government debt, um, all the currencies in Forex, they're under control. Uh, the big, huge exchange stabilization fund run by the Department of Treasury in the U.S. government, that's like the major control room. And, and then their side office is the J.P. Morgan, um, what do they call it? Office, office, investment office, chief investment office, CIO, chief investment office. That's like the adjunct in the private sector for the exchange stabilization fund. You saw damage with the London whale, but notice in the summer of 2012 or late spring, I guess it was May and June 2012, the London whale episode came out and they fixed that too. So they're very good at patching in the sovereign bond arena, in the currency arena, and in the bank arena. So what I'm hearing, and this is just in the last few weeks, uh, I'm hearing very strong word from my best source that what's likely instead of, ha of in by instead I mean not coming from a contagion within the banks, what's likely instead is that Shanghai is going to go for a very proper gesture, a very proper move toward a just uh, toward justice in the gold market, toward repricing the gold and silver. Uh, I don't know what to call them. I call them prices, but it, they're really ratios versus the dollar. Right. Uh, and you're seeing an explosion of of the dollar right now which should be good for gold. By, by that I mean an explosion of supply. In the last four years the, the money supply for the dollar has exploded while the gold price has not. Uh, and that's contrary to the way markets should work. Uh, if you weaken the dollar, which is the, by having extraordinary supply, then its nemesis should benefit and it's not. So the Chinese are really fed up with what's going on and they hold, now it's so funny to watch the the controversy that, oh, China might raise their official 1,045 tons of, of government reserves for gold. They might raise it up to three or maybe maybe 5,000. Well, they're holding at least 15,000. And they don't like seeing that their market value is being played with by New York and London. So here's what I'm hearing. I'm leading up to something here. Shanghai is going to reprice gold and silver, and I don't have exact numbers, but let's just throw something out there because it might be within the range of, of what could happen. It's certainly within the range of how it's described to me. And that is, they're just going to reprice gold to be at least double its current price. I mean like, like 2,600, 2,800, maybe 3,000. They're just going to reprice it. They're just going to set the price to be that, reprice that in Shanghai. They're going to reprice gold to be what they think is equilibrium for bringing about balance of supply and demand. Does that mean there will be a, a divergence in the London price and the Shanghai price uh, then? Yes, like 100%. <laughs> yeah, they're going to double the gold price to what London and New York post. And they're going to basically say, F you. This is the gold price that brings about near equilibrium. We're working on the equilibrium, they might say. We realize that London and New York have almost no gold and have been corruptly setting the price of gold and have been refusing the redemption, uh, not redemption, the settlement of futures contracts with delivery of gold. There's been no delivery of gold for two years in New York and London on futures contracts for gold. So, we in Shanghai are going to post this $2,880 gold price because we believe that that will bring about near equilibrium between supply and demand, which is required in a fair market. London and New York are not fair markets. 
So Jim, would that that then that, that would mean that all the gold uh, that's uh, being sold would be sold in London or New York or being offered for sale, whether in reality or not, that fourteen hundred, then uh, you know people will rush in to buy that up, wouldn't they? That would pretty much uh, wipe all the supply out, wouldn't it? Well, that's the whole point. My point is that there's no gold in London and New York for buying. So it would expose the fraud then. It would expose the fraud and lay uh, lay waste to their derivatives. But at the same time, if, if Shanghai does what I expect, they might make a formal statement like, all right, New York and London, if you don't like this, then arbitrage it. If you don't like the $2,800 gold price and you really think it's $1,200, then take all of your ample supply, buy what you can over there, take advantage of the low price, and sell it over here in Shanghai, but you don't have any. Right. So it's going to be a challenge to arbitrage when they cannot, and that will expose New York and London as fraudulent arenas. And then you get the derivative problems. Now, bear in mind that there are lots and lots of types of derivatives. The one that I'm referring to specifically are the Forex to gold derivatives. There are lots and lots of them. And they're not simple, some of them. There might be there might be like a triangle between the, the euro, the dollar, and gold. And and it, it just it just moves according to various factors within that triangle. I I'm not a real expert in that, but I'm told that, that the exotic derivatives are more involve more than one I'm sorry, more than one yeah, more than one currency besides gold. Gold's a super currency. Isn't that amazing, though, Jim, like, you know, with all these noises that have come out of the Western, uh, you know, establishment and the, and the media in the past 20 years, that gold is, uh, is nothing, you know, and yet gold plays such a central role between their own dealings as a financial instrument. Well, it does, but they also use heroin packets that sit side by side with gold bars in Wall Street banks. So they've got a lot of different things they regard as money. Narcotics is the money of the big cabal and totalitarian state coming up. There's another th reason why they like gold, and not, not reason, there's another piece of evidence as to why they like gold. I mean, they, they try the cabal with their Langley, uh, what should we call them, players, they try to stir up trouble, like in Libya. A few people realize that although Muammar Gaddafi was a nasty guy, and um, even though he was, you know, kind of an, of an em emperor, he won five United Nations awards for um, what's the word uh, philanthropy and and for development of his country and development of the water systems and development of smaller business. But we saw fit to run him out of his palace, disembowel him, and kill him so that we could steal his 104, 144 tons of gold. Now, I, I make the point firmly that the entire movement against Libya was secondarily to move weapons towards Syria through our embassy, illegal use of the embassy, but primarily to steal Gaddafi's gold. So what we really did, the, the U.S. government, uh, the cabal, the Wall Street bankers, the London bankers, the Langley guys working in concert with them all, it's the syndicate. What the syndicate really did was they wanted to steal 20 years of Libyan oil production. And they did in the form of gold. So what happened in Ukraine? They, they had their Maidan, they had their revolt, they had their coup d'etat led by Soros and the Langley crew of mercenaries with Blackwater. What's the first act indeed that they did? Well, the first thing was to move out $70 billion of oligarch money and put it in Swiss banks for safekeeping. What's the second thing they did? They stole 33 tons of gold. You know, they're not they're showing the value of gold in their war movements. Uh, they got a lot of hidden things like, you know, 
prosecution charges against Credit Suisse Bank in Switzerland uh, for supposed secret accounts, tax dodged accounts from Americans, but they want to fold Credit Suisse under UBS where they have better control to steal the Saudi gold that's in those two banks. So they show their cards all the time. Gold is a motive for theft in war. And I'd like to point out that as this, you know, if and when this happens, and this is the big indication that I've been given, if and when this happens on the gold repricing, expect silver to be repriced at something like $50. And, you know, that'll be a hot poker up the, uh, the boy's ass. And it'll cause some problems. But what will the effect be? How will the boys react? How will the banker cabal react out of Western Europe, London, and New York? Well, they're going to put their bond monetization and their hyper-monetary inflation, they're going to divert it toward the derivatives in a very open way. You're going to see a skyrocketing of volume, I think, on the order of 10 to 20 times. It's not going to be... Uh, hints and indications of 80 billion a month. It's going to be hints and indication of one to two trillion dollars a month. Maybe three or four trillion dollars a month. Maybe a spurt one month, and we're told that these 5.5 trillion dollars to patch over the derivatives is a one time deal, except that it happens again a month later. So it's going to cause an explosion in the volume. Of, of not so much the bond monetization, but hyper-monetary inflation to cover these things by the central banks. They call it QE, they call it bond monetization because it's diverted toward bonds, whether they're treasury bonds or mortgage bonds. This next wave is going to be directed toward derivatives, the type that link the gold price to the, the forex, the major currencies, the, the pound, the euro, the yen, and maybe to some degree the Swiss franc. So that's the shock wave they've got. And I've been told that, that this attack on the cabal has been planned. Um, it's very clever. It's indirect. And it takes the high road. You, you can't come back later and say, well, look what China did. They, 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 they forced a couple of German and French banks to go bust. Look what they did. They're bad guys. No. What you're going to hear is China tried to make legitimate the gold price and try to set right in a repricing the gold market. You can't really say, oh, gee, that's a bad thing. Look how horrible that they are. How horrible they, they tried to make the gold price correct according to equilibrium of supply and demand. No, there is no equilibrium in supply and demand in the gold market as we know it. There is only brute force of refusing to deliver in gold on futures contracts and threatening people who try to sue them for contract fraud, which is what it is. If you buy gold and they deliver you in, in dollars, that's fraud. You want the gold. They deny you and they threaten you by saying, you know, play ball with us or we'll boot you from the COMEX. And you're pariah. You can't trade here. In, in the other things that you like, like crude oil or, or who knows, cotton, copper. Right, right, right. Soybeans. Wheat, soybeans. Can't trade in anything because you want to make your point. You can't get gold from a gold contract. Well, gee. Can you name any other market where you can't get X from an X contract? So, that, so then I guess no, this, this is where the, the Chinese or the Russians and the Eastern Bloc, they are kind of fed up with it because uh, they are, they've also been uh, forced to play this game by their fraudulent rules, by the Western fraudulent rules, and they, they are the only boys big enough to take on the cabal. Yes, they are, and I think the reason that, that uh, China and Russia will take them on is quite simple, not a lot of different reasons, but they're fed up with their huge amount. I'm, I'm hearing Russia has at least 20,000 tons of gold. I'm hearing China has at least 15,000 tons of gold. They don't like that the West is setting a price without having right. any of, of what they hold in the East in huge volumes. China and Russia are also reacting to the Ukraine uh, propaganda, lies, war, subterfuge. The U.S. went in with their, their mercenaries 
and Mar and the European mercenaries organized by Soros, they they did a coup d'état and they blamed it on Russia. I mean, it's just insane. This is not they're they're treating the West is treating Russia as I heard from a very smart uh, colleague of mine. The West is treating Russia like Sudan, and you can't do that. Yes, absolutely right. Now, Jim, uh, in the past, you have on our shows you have said that Germany is also leaning towards the east. Is that one of the motives that they had for uh, requesting a repatriation of their gold from New York? I heard word from uh, uh, it, it's it's from a very very good source who's been value to me for quite some time. He heard that. The repatriation request in 2001. We heard all about it. Germany wants. You mean 2011? You mean? Oh gosh, right. I, I get it. right. Thank you. 2011. We heard that they wanted Germany wanted their their 330 tons of gold back, but we never heard why they made the request and why then. Well, it kind of fills in the blank that I, I heard uh, through German. Uh, channels and and from the voice the voice tapped his channels and got the information it was because in early 2011 the German government was given a preview as the lead dog nation in the NATO the US government gave a preview to the German government of their planned war in the Ukraine and the timetable was in the next two to three years, we're going to work to capture Ukraine and cut off Europe from the Russian energy supply. And Germany said, you're going to do what? Are you crazy? Are you nuts? There are a supply of energy, there are a supply of commodities, they're a big trade partner. What are you doing, you idiots in Washington? We want our gold back, you fools. All right, so that's a very different story from what we heard in early 2011 for a simple, innocent repatriation request following the one by Venezuela the year before. All right, so plot thickens. So Germany said, no, we don't want to be cut off from our energy and com commodity supply. We don't like this. And the division in Germany began three years ago. That's probably why the NSA went in there full bore to start their espionage and trade secrets and learning of plans in the highest level of German government toward collusion, if you will, with Russia. So I, I've identified four um, violations, big, big issues that Germany has with the West, and in particular, the Anglo-Americans, US, UK. They do not like the NSA violations. They're all through Siemens, their big telecom network. They're all through their parliament and bugging. They're all through the, the, the Merkel head offices. And it's so bad that when they have high-level meetings in the German government, they all deposit their cell phones in the outer corridor so that none of them are sitting inside used as Western listening devices. That's the first violation. The second violation is the Euro central bank inflation. The Germans have vivid memories of what happens with hypermonetary inflation. They don't want Prince Draghi and the Euro central bank to go on and, and embark on a gigantic bond monetization program that, that eclipses the, the one of the Fed in the United States. The Fed is primarily treasury bonds, but also some mortgage bonds. The Euro Central Bank under Prince Draghi, they want to go through all kinds of other things. They want to do stocks, they want to do Eastern European bonds, they want to do sovereign bonds from Southern Europe, the pigs. All right, the third, well, I'm, I should continue on that. The Germans are really fed up with the Euro Central Bank. The Bundesbank is their central bank, and they are at odds taking to court some of the principles and devices and vehicles, instruments used by the Prince Draghi. Uh, Euro Central Bank, the ECB, and, and they're, they're basically calling their, their 
recent patches, the LTFO, I can't remember, they each have acronyms, but it's a, it's a finance operation, a long-term finance, LTFO, I can't remember. But they, they've got, the Draghi ECB has various patches, and they try to make them super, super senior over sovereign bonds, which means they have higher priority than government bonds. And the courts say that this isn't legal. It's not even within the, the, the confines of, of uh, the structure of the European Central Bank. So the Germans, I think, not so much over espionage, but over the Ukraine war threatened cutoff of their energy and the European Central Bank inflation. I think they're going to bolt and get out. So you've got the German gold thefts, you've got the cutoff of energy, you've got the ECB inflation, and you've got the NSA violations. In Germany, Germany, they're saying, these are four gigantic indictments against our ally, our ally, the United States. So we'd like to cut the cord, and is that ever incredibly difficult? So they're, I think, giving lip service to the U.S., and saying things like, oh, yeah, we, we support the sanctions against Russia. Well, watch them work around the sanctions. Watch them continue and violate the sanctions. And we, we're getting a more open split. It's even in the press. The Minister of Finance and other ministers in uh, Germany are openly stating, we cannot honor the commitments of NATO. That's pretty big. That's pretty big. This is now reaching close to a boiling point with Germany. And NATO is kind of trying to uh, stretch themselves pretty thin from what I've been reading. You know, they're in Syria, they're the so-called ISIS, they're in Iraq, in Canada. Now they're having a debate of what kind of mission we're sending to Iraq. I thought Iraq was mission accomplished, but, uh, you know, so... Uh, so if Germany leads the way out for the European countries, then I imagine there will be a lot more that would also follow. Well, yeah, France will follow immediately, and so will Austria, and so will Netherlands. And uh, th those are those are some of the core nations of, of Europe. Those are the central. Those are the ones that have the, tr the trade surpluses. <laughs> those are the ones that aren't broke. Um, w w what we're seeing is, you know, with this Iraq situation, I don't want to go on, on and on, but I got a, a funny little comment. Well, clever way of putting it. Endless war is the policy of Langley. It's the policy of the U.S. military. It's the policy of the U.S. government. So when you had some resolution in Iraq that went against the U.S. policy, so we're back. Obama said we won't return with boots on the ground. Well, yeah, we will. Uh, maybe there'll be golf shoes, though because he's he likes golf he just set the record for 148 rounds of golf while as a sitting president so when he should be attending his uh, security highest security meetings and and uh, staff meetings with the cabinet he's playing golf intelligence briefing he's playing golf he's raising funds so you know it just confirms my opinion of what the US presidents have become in the last two decades they're figureheads they they're permitted to go off and have fun their their wives are permitted to go spend millions on silly trips and they are in charge of fundraising they give speeches for fundraising I mean what are we ever gonna see eggs and tomatoes thrown at the president at a fundraising meeting well they're kind of geared up in advance to, to be favorable in the audience. I'd like to say that Germany, with Merkel, made an indication, this was I think early September, at the Wales NATO summit. And it did not get much press because the West controls the press. But it really didn't get much attention in the alternative press. But what, what happened at the Wales NATO summit was Chancellor Merkel of Germany basically came out and said all the NATO commitments cannot be all honored. I mean, we can't do that. There, there are too many NATO commitments. They're too expensive. They're too costly to the economies. They don't make sense. We cannot honor all the NATO commitments. So now, a month later, 
it's getting a little more attention and it's coming out of other mouths in the German government, namely their ministers. I think Germany is going to split. I've got two different sources who confirm the same thing, that Germany has already made commitments to Russia and China, and these, these sources have the confirmation coming from Chinese clients of theirs. And I'm talking about commercial clients, banking clients, and the word is all over the upper echelons of Russia and China that Germany is already working with Russia and China toward the BRICS new gold back currency. It's also going to have a silver backing. It's a precious metal, gold and silver backed BRICS currency. We're not going to get the nonsense propaganda piece, the super sovereign international monetary fund basket of currencies. We're not going to get the reformed IMF basket. SDRs. The SDR, right, which consists of the dollar, the euro, the pound, and the yen. We're not going to get the super sovereign reform of that basket. It's not going to be expanded to the Chinese yuan, the Russian ruble, gold, and silver from four to eight in the basket. Why? Russia and China won't go along because the West wants to control the basket through the IMF, through the ratios, the weightings. And Russia and China say, no, we don't like your weightings. Those are devices to keep suppressed the ruble. And we see how London and Wall Street are suppressing the ruble improperly right now. There's a, a run on the ruble. It's going down. There are lots of questions about how the banking industry might might operate in Russia, whether they might do some capital control. We're causing havoc. We're causing an increase in all imported prices in Russia and their economy. So Russia turns around and says, well, you got sanctions against our banks. You've got gimmicking on our interference, rather, on our ruble currency. No, we're not going to cooperate with your IMF basket. And isn't it interesting that the BRICS post, which is the mouthpiece on the Internet, it's, it's the, uh, the online publication, no, oh, I don't know, it's kind of like the syndicated version of AP, UPI, but for the BRICS, and it's very immature at this point. By that I mean young and not developed. We're seeing stories <laughs> that the, the BRICS nations support the IMF reform currency. This is a fake in, in fencing with sword competitions, they have what they call a feint. That means you 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 you, right. you, fake, you fake right, and you move left. Yes. Okay, that's common in football. It's called a head and shoulder fake. You fake left and you bolt right, and you, you guys the guys left with his thumb up his butt uh, on defense. Well, that's what they're planning with the bricks. The the Americans and the British do not expect what's coming, but the Germans do because they're part of it. Unbelievable things are going on. This is major chess going on. Yes, it certainly seems to be. And, of course, if you all uh, remember that most of the grandmasters have been Russians, so uh, it would not be surprising if, in the end, uh, it's they who uh, do the checkmate. So as far as the checkmating is concerned, uh, uh, what about these uh you know, funds like the GLD fund, uh, what's happening uh, in those as far as since we're talking about gold here, Jim, uh, and the role that it's going to play? And what you're talking about with Russia and China being fed up, it makes sense that they're going to reprice uh, these metals. So what about this GLD fund? Well, just to finish off your chess analogy, uh, the Russians are not only chess masters, a long history of them, but they're holding a lot of pieces. It's like you've got a chessboard, and Putin's got still both of his knights and one of his two castles and both of his bishops, and he's working his way uh, across the, the chessboard. And the West, they only have one knight and one rook, one castle, and a lot of other pieces are missing. And, and by that I mean Russia is holding tremendous commodity wealth, tremendous resource wealth, oil, gas, structural metals, industrial metals, all kinds of things. What they don't have is, say, agricultural output. They don't have a lot of that. They'll get more of that later. All right, so they're not only good at playing chess, they got more pieces. Okay, that's my point. It's a two twofold side. The GLD is an interesting thing you bring up. Uh, 
I've mentioned the GLD in the past. I've got one uh, guy in, in my in my uh, my my group of analysts. We don't know what to call ourselves. One one or two of us call it the Brain Trust. I like to call it my staff of colleagues. How about the jackasses? <laughs> no, no, they're 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 often smarter than a jackass. I wouldn't want to insult them. Uh, I have no problem in surrounding myself with smarter people, with better connected people. No problem whatsoever. Thank uh, you, Jim. <laughs> <laughs> good. That's good. <clears throat> um, a few months ago, maybe a little while longer ago, um, Euro Raj, my, my colleague, trusted colleague, very bright fellow with a London banking experience, he said the GLD is really a securitization of gold in motion from the many many global mining firms and here's what the, here's what I mean by that uh, just forget forget for a moment put aside for a moment that GLD actually has some inventory put aside that fact and focus on the gold in motion you got Barrick you got <clears throat> Newmont you got uh, Royal, you've got Gold Core, you've got the South Africans, you've got lots and lots of different major gold companies that produce gold. Well, when they're done producing it through their milling process and it reaches a certain high concentration level, um, it, it becomes essentially a gold bar. And its concentration might not be, you know, three nines or four nines, but it, it might be in the 90s. So that's going to have some value as inventory. But the inventory gets moved. It's in shipment to the refineries. So what the clever Wall Street and big mining companies have done is they've found a device where you can invest in something called the SPDR Gold Trust aka the GLD fund and some of the inventory there is not stacked in shelves it's output from the mills going to and from the refineries that eventually find their way to the comex this is the gold in motion it's like you know you got a whole lot of tennis shoes or a whole lot of television sets and they're in motion on the trucks going across country to Walmart say well someone owns them someone right. owns the inventory of what's being shipped well they did a clever device and it's it's loaded with fraud but much of the inventory reported by GLD we believe is gold in motion from the mining companies they're down to 767 tons it started with. So there's not. This is not even in necessarily like uh, refined uh, bullion. Is still in the process of perhaps getting to that stage. Yes, there's something they call a dory bar, and it, I think that comes. I'm not sure, but I think it comes. My guess it comes from a French D apostrophe O R of ore right. of gold of right. gold. So a dory bar is a ninety percent or more refined. Uh, gold bar. It might not be a bar. It might be just a big, big, ugly hunk that resembles right. a rectangle. Yeah. It doesn't have to be perfect when it enters the refinery process. All right, so the GLD started <clears throat> with 1,350, 1,340 tons. When it got below 1,000, we started, before the whole concept of gold motion came in, we started wondering well what's the critical point for the GLD before problems arise and Euro Raj way back a year and a half ago said I think it's under a thousand and probably for sure around 700 tons once they get anywhere near 700 tons they're gonna have extreme strain in the system and very little GLD gold inventory to steal to raid and, and the way they do that is the big banks, and only the big banks, have the privilege of, uh, and I'll get to this thing in a minute because it's really important, only the big banks have the privilege of putting together baskets of these stocks for GLD and demanding redemption in the form of gold. If you say, well, I've got 22 shares 
of, uh, of GLD or 2,200 shares of GLD or, or 150 shares of GLD, and I'd like to redeem and get my gold, they'll tell you to go get lost. You're not, you're not big enough. You don't meet the prospectus requirements. Well, some big players have met the prospective requirements, and they're told to get lost anyway. The ones who are not told to get lost are the big banks that are trying to supply the comics. So clearly, the rating channels for the comics come through GLD, not exclusively, but they include the GLD. I am of the opinion, this is just a, a guess, a raw guess, but it's certainly not an ignorant guess, and it's not based on a tremendous amount of information, but I'm thinking rock bottom zero for the GLD is 600 to 700 tons. There'll be no more to raid of physical bars out of the GLD inventory for the purpose of replenishing COMEX in this manner when we get to 600 to 700 tons. And we're in that ballpark right now. We're at 767. Now, what I mean by that is that of the inventory claimed by the GLD fund, I believe at least 600 tons is the, exactly the gold in motion on trucks, on flights, from the big mining companies to and from refineries that eventually find their way to the COMEX. And I'd like to point out one other thing about the COMEX, and it's not exactly a GLD topic, but about a year ago, Scotia Makata, which is a subsidiary of Scotia Bank, um, a Canadian big bank, Right. They used to be a very reputable gold bullion bank. Well, I don't think so anymore. I, I say they've, they've signed contracts in Satan's service because they're making available their legitimate inventory for the purposes of aiding Goldman Sachs, J.P. Morgan, Bank of America, and Citigroup because if you look at the actual movements of the COMEX inventory where they provide details – you see all over the place in the last year movement from Scotia to one of the others. You see a lot of movement from the others, but you see mainly movement out of, of Scotia Makata. Makata. Actually, that's a question one of my listeners had one time: is like, you know, is there any gold left in Scotia Makata? Because you're right, Scotia is the, is the big one up here in Canada and even in the world. It, and I think they used to sit on the LBMA. I'm not sure if they still do or not, but uh, yes, so, okay. I, I think that uh, Scotia is going to get drained, and I'd, I'd love to know what promises were given to them for signing up in Satan's service. I don't use the term lightly. Many Wall Street bankers are Satanists. Many of these fascists are Satanists. These are not Christians. They are not Jews. They're Satanists, and some of them are hiding within the other religions. But they're Satanists. And I don't want to get into too much of that. It's just extremely ugly stuff because they have child sacrifices. Yes, I, I would agree with you, Jim. You know, and I would go as far as to say that it's not just some of them. I would say all of them at the top, uh, you know, the, the top echelons are Satanists. Well, it, it's hard to say. They don't, they don't exactly publish their data. Right. And, and we, we should really move along because I think they've got very tight relationship with the Satanists in the Vatican. Yes, absolutely. Okay, go on. The money, the money handlers in the Vatican, not the College of Cardinals. The two houses of the Vatican. Two very different houses of the Vatican. The ones run by the Jesuits are Satanists, which is a, a real slap at the, the, the name of Jesus. All right, so I think the GLD investors, to sum it up, Dash, they're the dumbest guys in the room. So one day they're going to be left holding this piece of paper, which is, uh, you know, not worth uh, anything at all. Not worth, the, not worth the ink that was right. spent to put on it. Yes, okay. They're running, the boys are running out of this golden motion to raid, and notice some of the exacerbation that has happened in gold supply from the mining companies. Um, they uh, they had a shutdown of the big barrack property project. They sunk eight and a half billion dollars into Pascualama. 
in Chile on the Argentine border. All right, well, that's a lot of inventory that got taken away. It's just not coming online. And then you had the Kennecott uh, property in Utah with the giant mile-long mudslide. They're, they're still digging out of that. So and this is a point that we're going to get to. Well, we might as well just go to the point number five here, Dash, because it, it fits. We can get the point. Yeah, so you're going to talk about that the supply is going to get really, really constrained and tight in, in, in gold. Uh, a new gold supply is basically non-existent uh, looking uh, ahead into the future. Yeah, the, the mining companies are having to, to do investments, uh, logistics, management of projects when the price of their product is being suppressed. So they're making this. So twelve twelve hundred dollar gold does not support new exploration and probably is not profitable for the gold that is uh, for the companies, even now at that price. You know the gold that they are actually bringing out of the ground to sell it at twelve hundred does not make them profitable. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. Well, for the marginal properties, yeah. So you take a property where they they really needed a thirteen hundred and thirty dollar or thirteen hundred. Ten dollar gold price to be profitable. Well, they just put it in mothballs. They say we're we're suspending operations on that, and what they're doing is they're they're focusing on the best properties, like the ones with a nine hundred and fifty dollar price. I'm sorry, cost. So they can make money on a nine fifty cost. They can make money on a thousand twenty cost. So all the projects, all the deposits that are their biggest profitability potentials. They're getting put into overdrive as the marginal properties are put to the side. So these mining companies are actually accelerating the whole peak gold concept. When are we going to start seeing declines? Well, wait till the price goes up and you'll see that they're still not producing a lot more gold. What we're seeing now, I got to be honest with you, I made a projection in 2012. I, I said that we're probably going to see a decline in the 2013 global gold output in volume. And we did not. It was pretty much flat or slightly positive. But 2014 is the year that the decline is coming, Desh. And, and here's kind of why I got it wrong. I don't mind admitting errors in, in forecasts. It's, it's part of the science. What went wrong? What, what did I not see? And how can I learn from that for the next forecast? Well, what I did not see is something that got pointed out to me. When I made the forecast and I told them, well, we'll see. They told me that the contracts are long term. They tend to be two and three years. They tend to be even more. So if they've got an obligation to supply uh, a, a certain refiner uh, and they got a, a contract from a bank in the form of covenants to meet debt requirements, by coming through with output, well, then they're going to bloody well go through with the output and not make much money or have a small loss to avoid different problems like violations of covenants and seizure of property and ooh, all kinds of weird stuff. So I got wrong the length of contracts and the, the durability, the, the what's the word, endurance, uh, longevity of some contracts. That, and now you're starting to hear that with some of the mining companies. They say, well, we, we finished the obligations for that contract and we're not going to renew that so we're going to mothball this project because the contract is ended. What I'm hearing, no not what I'm hearing, this, this is now in the news, in the mine, mining industry news to expect the gold output to, to decline by about 50 percent in the next couple of years unless we get a change in the gold price. We have, it's going down so this is like an assurance we're going to see massive declines in the gold output. And there are no new discoveries anywhere. And there's a reason for that. The budgets are being slashed. So when you don't have the profitability from a good, fair gold price, it not only makes the, the projects you know, borderline profitable at all, it means you're, you, you're, you're cutting into the extraneous areas of business like discovery, exploration. Oh boy, this, this is going to get really weird because. Uh... So then these things they do board well for people who have been, you know, lately questioning uh, their uh, belief that gold is something that they should hold. 
uh, this this would bode well for them for the future because if gold is indeed repriced like you said in Shanghai and the supply of gold is going down by something like 50 percent which is huge then uh, some point in the future and possibly the near future we could be looking at some significant moves in uh, the paper price of gold as we call it. Well I don't expect the, 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 sh the lower volume of gold output to affect the gold price on the paper side. In fact I expect the paper side to go down 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 and not react at all to, to the actual operations side of the gold mining industry. They're, they're basically going to wreck the gold mining industry in order to protect the dollar, in order to protect themselves from these big incidents. But what they're not going to be able to protect themselves from is the Chinese repricing the gold to something like 2,700 to 3,000 per ounce. There are a couple other points here regarding the mining companies. It's not just the suppressed gold price. I mean, do you want to invest in something where the output has a suppressed price? Do you want to use leverage on a suppressed output product of an industry? I don't. That's why I told my clients in early 2008 to get out of the mining companies' stocks, to stick with gold metal. And don't worry about the gold and silver price. It might go down, might go up, might go down, might go up, but it might go down a lot when we're near the climax. The climax being when the COMEX and the LBMA are destroyed. There are other points that, that put at risk the mining companies and it's things like you know, operation expenses when until recently like the uh, oil price, um, lumber price, cement price, all these different costs they were rising, and they're not rising right now because we're in the end game, as I like to call it, and my client, not my client, my my own little staff likes to call it. We're in the end end game now, where the dollar is exploding, and I, I made some comments. I should interject here while I'm on the point. I made comments in the last year or more that the end game will be marked by the dollar rising against everything against commodities, against oil, against gold, the dollar will be rising, against competitor major currencies, the dollar will rise and rise and rise, then die. Ha. The mining companies have other threats, environmental concerns, the, the local jurisdictions say you're polluting our water, you got runoff from your, your, your mill operations, you've got then they've got labor problems, you're not paying the workers enough, they, they see that the mining companies are making a lot of money and it's really not trickling down. You have cost of living increases for the, the workers and they can't get increases for their wages to cover the higher price of food. All these things are causing big governments, important governments like Chile, to, uh, you know, to bring a halt to certain projects, Indonesia to bring a halt. Malaysia, bring a haul. It's not just gold, it's copper and other, other me important metals. Uh, this, this problem about the budget is so important that the Australian mining companies, which are a very important niche, they're seeing a 30% cut in their budgets for exploration this, this past year. And it's going to continue in, into this year. I'd like to see the mining companies actually do a strike not against uh, not against operations I'd like to see them do a strike and say we're not going to supply gold of COMEX anymore we're not going to supply your your vehicle for gold in motion in the GLD anymore we're going to stockpile our output and we've got some new investors who've promised us you know X hundred million or X billion dollars a year to continue our operations because they're doing, I'm thinking China and Russia and, and maybe Japan and maybe Korea and some other Asian countries, India, uh, they might put up some investment capital to the mining companies for the right of buying gold, say, at a mere 1600 three years from now from this accumulated 
stockpile of inventory. But it's a major challenge for the mining companies because how do they pay their workers now and how do they pay their executive compensation packages now? And it's very, very difficult. China's not cooperating in that direction. What they're doing instead is they're just buying mining companies. They're buying significant stakes in Western mining companies. So it's going to get very hairy. Um, and, and I, I, and I'm different. I, I don't really go, Oh my gosh, look what they're doing to the COMEX gold price. I just laugh at them. They're they're hastening the shutdown of the COMEX. Uh, I, I don't know why they haven't done a force majeure yet. I don't think they want the controversial publicity of a force majeure where a lot of contracts are just de deemed null and void because of adverse conditions in the market that they did. No, you can't prove they did. You can't prove anything because the court of law in the United States is really quite a joke on the financial side. Well, this force majeure wouldn't happen in isolation anyways. It would also be some other markets, I would imagine, that would happen altogether, uh, you know, not just in the gold market, right? Well, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. Well, we got one topic left, Dash, and let, let's, let's try to fit it in. It's, uh, we don't need to spend too much time on it, but what do you say? Absolutely. Go right ahead, Jim. Oh, okay, I thought you were going to ask a question. <laughs> No, no, no. You, 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 you uh, state the topic and give us the info. There's a very curious event going on. It's very hard to understand completely. It's very thorny. It involves the highest powers of the elite on planet Earth, the highest level of banking and the hierarchy. As a preface, in Basel, Switzerland, there's a bank called the Bank for International Settlements. That's the Bank of Central Banks. That's the Central Bank of Central Banks is how it's defined. At least that's how I have heard it described. Yes, and they, they, it's almost like they're on a public relations campaign in the last 30 years to change some of their images. And I don't, I don't want to get into their... Uh, conference at the very end right before 1900 they had a big conference and they weren't really too reluctant to show their identity then but now they do show reluctance uh, in, in exposing their identity and agendas but let's just call them the central bank of central banks and they you know we, we hear about Basel II rules, Basel III rules well, it's from the, the banker overlords in Basel, Switzerland at BIS who make rules on what bank capital ratios must be maintained and what assets can be considered justifiable capital. Okay, they're the rule makers. All right, they're the overlords. So if they're the overlords, why are they making an appeal to the BRICS nations to secure a useful role in the next chapter. And I define the next chapter as a return to the gold trade standard and eventually following maybe side by side, perhaps with that gold trade settlement, gold backed currencies. You can't have gold trade settlement without some kind of a gold instrument. And what I'm hearing is a gold trade note used as a letter of credit at the short-term gold instrument, uh, you lay out your capital. If you don't lay out your gold capital, you don't have a letter of credit. You can't conduct trade. So basically, the, the BRICS nations led by Russia and China are planning to have trade that's secured on the credit side for very short-term credit by gold bullion. That is what I think the BRICS Central Bank is going to be, and the BRICS Development Bank has got a false name. It's really going to be the BRICS Central Bank, where they're going to hold a lot of gold. I think a shitload of gold, like thousands of tons of gold. All right, so why is the BIS appealing to the BRICS leaders? I call them the dynamic duo, Russia, China, RNC, in some of my emails. Why are they appealing to the BRICS nations for a useful role, saying things like, we can provide a useful service for your new system. We have a history of 
doing professional uh, banking. We have a history of doing professional accounting and oversight. We could be useful to the BRICS. Okay, it, it's like the wolf knocking on the hen house farm building saying, okay, uh, you want us to be guards? We're pretty good at keeping nasties away, but okay, yeah, we're wolves, but we can be useful. We're good at counting chickens, and we're good at, at understanding, you know, how many hundreds of chickens you can have at this layer without threatening the food supply at a lower level, or even having a collapse of the whole platform for too many chickens on that level. Okay. We're really good experts at chicken farming. Wow. Wow. Well, Jim, you know, just to, just to give you, uh, just to uh, perhaps present another viewpoint, now there is some truth that these guys do have a history of experience in this department, which the Russians and the Chinese and the BRICS do not. So do you not think that if they could actually give them some expertise uh, and actually play a role of course, uh, you know, if, uh, if they, their wolfing tendencies could be kept in check. Well, to me, it's kind of like the 1913 Federal Reserve Act. Let's get these experts in banking to manage the U.S. Central Bank, and let's try to stop these crises that seem to happen. Good point. You've answered my question. <laughs> we don't want to give the wolf a role because once he's inside, he might start using some of his influence to bribe, say, a minister of finance in Russia, offer them some good heroin deals, offer them good access to children for their pedophiles, for satanic sacrifices. I have no idea what else they might offer. Maybe, right. maybe what they'll offer is, is more simple things, like give us a junior role for the finance committee of your BRIC central bank or else we're going to release viruses into Russia and China that you don't have cures for. We do. And furthermore, we'll engineer harp events to wall off your rain systems like we're doing in California. So observe California. This is a success story for creating drought as an example of our harp weather engineering. We've already used the harp engineering against China in the last 10 years to deny them rainfall. They've got some rivers that have dried up. I think there's something like seven rivers that are in the, 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 the province where Beijing is, and three of them are in trouble. Um, so, okay, the wolf, the BIS, might ask for a junior role. Uh, I'd like to give them a role, a water boy. Uh, you can clean out the hen house of its shit and you can operate the hose and you can deliver pails of water and you can make sure the plumbing works for the water, but we don't want you inside except under armed guard to clean out the shit in the coops. That's the role I want to give them. It's less than junior. It's latrine duty. That's what I'd like to give the BIS. And I don't know how it's going to turn out, but I think the BIS is going to get kind of... Remember back when G7 became G8 and Russia had uh, the rights to sit in and uh, China had the right to sit in the hallway? Okay, that's the kind of thing I'd like to give the BIS for the BRICS meetings. Let them sit in the hallway and be the first ones briefed while they have latrine duty cleaning out the chicken coops of their shit. Now, what do you say to some of these uh, people in alternative media, particularly that uh, that suggest that the BRICS themselves are actually controlled by Western, you know, elites such as the BIS? I wish I were an expert in that. I, I doubt the story. Some of my best sources are saying it's not true. I'm not hearing a lot of evidence to follow that up, though, when they claim it's not true. I'm hearing stories, and I've I got to emphasize, I am not an expert in this. I, I just have opinions once things are put on the table as to how things should be arranged 
like, you know, giving latrine duty to the BIS or the BRICS Central Bank. But uh, this is very complicated. There's a lot of stories that the Rothschilds were booted out of the Kremlin two years ago. And the Rothschilds, for those who don't know, control 95% of the world's central banks. The ones that don't control are Iran, um, Syria, and North Korea. Well, maybe I'm understating it. Maybe they control more than 95% of central banks. Maybe it's 98% of central banks. So if the Rothschild family was insulted by Putin and the Kremlin, it seems to me like if, if that was the case, and I'm not saying it definitely was, but if that was the case, I'm trying to make a conditional argument here because I'm not an expert in this. And I've been... Well, it's, it's Jim, to, to, uh, to support what you're saying, I think it's impossible to be an expert in this because none of us are going to have the inside track into what really goes on at those levels. Uh, you know, if somebody actually did, uh, it, it would be like that, uh, you know, from a movie called or somebody and if I tell you I'll have to kill you so basically you know this information is never really going to be available to people at our level so we can only speculate right and that's why I try to make a, a, a speculative argument in the form of a conditional statement if the Rothschilds were insulted by being pushed out of say finance roles in the Kremlin and that's what I heard from a couple of very well informed people if that was the case and they had their let's say feelings hurt to the point where they want some vengeance then I believe the the Ukraine war is exactly that now the Rothschilds have some history with the Russians back in sometime around 1900 and 1910 right around that period uh, during the uh, the Tsarist the late days of the Tsarist Empire, the Romanov family was Tsar. Right. And they told the, the Rothschilds, we don't want you to bring your banking expertise into Russia. And Rothschild, I don't know which one of the Rothschilds, there's so many of them, and, and they're all Satanists, and none of them are nice guys, and they like to just create a war here and there, or create the Soviet Union. What the, what the Rothschild said to Romanov was, we'll be back. So they funded the Bolshevik revolution and toppled the Romanovs and had them all executed. So yeah, he was back. The Rothschilds were back. And not only did they help to support Karl Marx as the, um, what's the word, ideologue, uh, the, high, right. the high priest, but they funded the high priests of fascism at the same time in Central Europe. I'm talking about the Rothschilds funding both sides. The expert in creating wars with both sides is the Rothschilds. So I think we've got some very dangerous situations right now because it could be, if this argument is true, it could be that many of the bankers in the Rothschild camp are in trouble in trouble of, of losing their livelihoods, their jobs, maybe even their lives. Is that why we had that spate of the suiciding bankers? I think it is. I, I think these are people who were in service to the Rothschilds through J.P. Morgan, and they were given unwanted flying lessons without any wings. They knew too much. Yes. So these... Uh, I think the cabal fa fascist bankers are cornered. I think they're limited. I think they're drained. And, I, and some of them might face extermination. The, this is the end of the, the road. I mean, you call it blind alleys. You call it uh, they're running out of road to, to kick the can, and besides the can's gone nuclear. But the, this is the end of the road for the franchised central bank system, which is the Rothschilds family. This is the end of the franchise central bank system of fiat money, of unbacked money. Fiat money means money that has a value by declaration, fiat. It doesn't right. have a backing of, of gold. 
And I, I like to take a little exception to the term of fiat. You, you don't get uh, a value of a currency by stating it. You get a value, a real value of it. I'm not talking about you know the, the forex value. That is from declaration. That is from stating it by fiat. But there's a an, a hidden value that's that's from the implicit backing of these currencies. They all have a backing. They're debt. They're sovereign debt. And notice that a year ago the U.S. Congress passed legislation that suspended the U.S. government debt limit. Okay, that undermined the dollar as a currency. Notice they've always turned down an independent audit of Fort Knox for the U.S. gold reserves. And on the statements of the Department of Treasury, you see nonsense like deep gold, deep storage gold. Well, that's nothing more than barrack properties of unmined ore. So the integrity of the dollar is all gone. Uh, the prestige of the Treasury bond is all gone. And the usage of J.P. Morgan... Uh, and exchange stabilization fund run by the Department of Treasury. The, the, the CIO and the Department of Treasury, they're both using derivatives to an extraordinary degree. And that's why you'll never see an end to the 0%. And that is the point I made now for three years running, four years running. You'll never see an end of 0% because now it's important as the, for a feeder in the system of cheap, cost-free money to put into their interest rate derivative machinery and produce artificial demand of the 10 and 30 year bond. So you put in the, the free money, you get these treasury bills of very short duration, they're used as swap collateral and poof, in comes the long-term swap versus short-term swap that's the essence of the interest rate derivative and it produces gigantic derivative demand, artificial demand for treasury bonds. And evidence of this activity is the failures to deliver of treasury bonds. And, and they come up with a propaganda statement that's pure BS, pure nonsense. They say the demand is so strong for treasuries that the Wall Street's having a hard time finding adequate supply because no one wants to get rid of theirs. No, they're not. That's not it at all. They have artificial demand that's going above and beyond what the supply dictates, above and beyond even what the U.S. debt, government debt, produces, and they're lying about that also. They had a recent statement, Dash, that said something like $570, $600 billion was the Treasury, uh, U.S. government uh, debt for fiscal year 2000 and and uh, 14 that ended in September? No, it was a lie. Take a look at just a basic, unadjusted, raw, nominal number. It went up a trillion dollars. So they come up with these adjustments for this, adjustments for that. <laughs> you can't put seasonality on a yearly number because <laughs> there's, yeah. there's no, there's no, you know, this year is a different season from no, it's all one year that you got a full cycle. <laughs> so they they got caught in their lies. Uh, they got a $400 billion lie on the government debt, U.S. government debt, for fiscal year that ended in September. It's, it's all in the data. It's just basic as hell. So they're getting exposed on their interest rate derivatives for um, the failures to deliver Treasury bonds, the 10 and 30 years. And I think when China comes and reprices silver and gold, primarily gold to get the headlines, but also silver because it is a monetary metal. you got a lot of bad analysis out there that disputes the assumption that it's a monetary metal. No, it's going to be included in the Russian and Chinese new BRICS currency. You're going to be, it's going to be loaded. I don't know what the ratio is going to be, but it's not going to be 50 to 1, 60 to 1, 70 to 1. I think it's going to be more like 25 to 1, and if you look at the a great... Uh, I'd, be, I'd, I'd be all for it, Jim. Oh, well, I think a lot of gold enthusiasts would be all for it. But what I'm looking forward to is the hot poker up the asses of the London and New York bankers who realize, oh, my gosh, we've just seen destroyed. If this sticks, if this sticks, we've just seen a destruction of the Forex derivatives linking to gold. All of them. Wow. And that means that the U.S. will be will be dragging, kicking and screaming 
to admit that the comics in LBMA have no more gold. The Queen's gold is gone in Bank of England. And, and I, I know for a fact, based on uh, The Voice, he said that he's part of a group that's been draining London of gold a thousand tons a month since April of 2012. So we're going on 30 months now. 30,000 tons have been drained out of London. They're being prepared for the third world there. And that's one reason Scotland wants out. They don't want to have, they'd, they'd rather link up with the North Sea oil wealth and, and kick off their thousand year old mortal enemy of the British. <laughs> Anyone who thinks the Scots love the British is brain dead. Oh, you, yeah, right, right. Uh... Well, you know, this is, you have again uh, given us uh, much to chew on. My only concern, Jim, is that as this uh, system, which obviously cannot be held together, like these band-aids being applied here, there, you know, like bandages being, uh, it's bleeding uh, from all its, uh, you know, everywhere that you, it's, the body's bleeding from all types of cuts to it. Like you said, the dollar would die a death by a thousand cuts. My concern is, that uh, these uh, megalomaniacs, uh, you know, will uh, uh, take uh, a lot of people down with them, which is why we are starting to see these things such as the Ebola virus and all that kind of crap. And who knows what else might be in store, because I don't think that they're going to go quietly into the night. Well, clearly not. Um, I'd like to see some of them at a higher level treated to flying lessons without a parachute or wings. I'd like to see... Now that, that, that might happen. Well, you know, it, it might. might. There was a report six or eight months ago that a, a high-level Citigroup vice president was on a hit list. Yet, I haven't seen any high-ranking Wall Street banker of that level, let alone Citigroup, um, die from many causes. We, we have seen a, a false story that Jamie Dimon had throat cancer. Um, my joke is it's from lying in front of Congress. <laughs> But uh, the other joke is, well, he'll probably seek treatment uh, for his cancer in uh, Paraguay, where the other Nazis are. Um, no, I, I think there are two things that hold the system together. They're very effective in holding the system together. They're war and viruses. And we're seeing them. Um, the, the Ukraine war, for those who aren't aware, came precisely in its initiation when a global currency reset was agreed upon by well over 50 nations. The global currency reset was going to reestablish the gold price at a higher level versus all the major forex currencies. It did not happen because we were treated to a new war in Ukraine. I leave you with the question. To interrupt China and their plan for repricing gold at double the current and repricing silver at say triple the current what new war will we be given well that is uh, a question that we can um, speculate upon till the cows come home but hey it could it could materialize anywhere in the world in the Middle East you know even in the in the Far East uh, who knows who knows Jim you know where and uh, but you're right the possibility certainly exists that something will materialize and uh, we'll just have to wait and see. Well, so here's, here's a candidate, Iraq, Syria, Turkey. Well, Turkey would be huge if that's... Uh, no, where, I mean but... one war in Iraq, Syria, Turkey, that whole region. And, and right now it, it's on fire. What about Saudi Arabia? I think you're going to have internal problems. Right now, what I'm hearing is there were about three or four very important tribes, and the current royal family has kept them down for 30 years. But now, with Fahd gone, King Fahd gone, and King Abdullah very weak, what we're seeing is no strong members and the next generation, meaning age 60 or so, age 55, no strong members of the, the Saad, uh, Fad, Fad and Abdullah family, they're brothers. 
Fahd was the older brother, and it went to the younger brother. And um, they kept down. They suppressed the other families, the other tribes. And those tribes got stronger while the Fahd Abdullah family got weaker. And now you're seeing a tremendous battle for power while at the same time a lot of pressure internally for reforms. And here's the big zinger for Saudi Arabia uh, according to my best source in the Middle East. He's, he's, he's lived in uh, one of the Persian Gulf nations now for about four years. He said what he's hearing is the big zinger force in Saudi Arabia is the women. They're tired of being given second-class citizenship. They're tired of being treated by the royals as essentially toys and slaves. So they're looking for reform. They're looking for business reform. A lot in the business community are really fed up with what they call appropriation, which is a Saudi royal coming into the office and saying, uh, you got a really nice chain of retail stores here. We like it. We want to buy it. Here's our price. And the owner says, yeah, but you're offering me, you know, $100 million, and we all know that it's worth three times that. And then the royal says to the businessman and or the group of owners, well, if you don't take the $100 million offer, we might increase it to like $130 million. That's as high as we go. If you don't do it, we're going to have all kinds of tax violations on you. And we might throw some of you in prison for oh, whatever we feel like. All right, it's called the appropriation fraud. Uh, uh, what's the word? Thefts, confiscation by the Saudi royals. A lot of backlash is building for Islamic reform, women reform, uh, appropriation uh, obstacles to, to reform them, to, to halt them, not reform them, to stop them. So a lot is going on. I think Saudi Arabia is going to fall, and you're going to see new leaders. But in the meantime, all through this process, they're embracing China. And in a matter of, of weeks or months, you're going to hear the Saudis that make announcement that they accept payment for their crude oil in non-dollars. And it's going to cause a huge controversy because the United States and the dollar is built upon the petrodollar de facto standard. In other words, South Korea, um, Belgium, they collect treasury bonds so they can import oil purchased from Saudi Arabia. They pay for the Saudi oil in treasury bills. They pay for it in dollars in the form of the vehicle treasuries. So when Saudi says you don't need to pay us with your treasury bills anymore, these nations, a lot of nations, are going to turn around and say we don't need to hold treasuries anymore. And you're going to have a new wave of dumping of treasuries and a new wave QE4 where the Federal Reserve says, well, we'll cover them all with what? new printed money, and then comes the shockwave, the aftershock, the other OPEC nations like Kuwait, uh, like uh, Bahrain, like UAE, um, all these other nations, Oman, Qatar, all the other OPEC nations, including the non-Persian Gulf, like Nigeria. They're going to say, well, we're going to do what Saudi does. Uh, they don't need dollars to pay. Well, we don't need dollars to pay. And then you're going to get another wave of dumping of treasuries because these nations hold treasuries. Right now, one of the most nervous nations in the world, nations, the, the most nervous nations in the world for their sovereign wealth funds are the Persian Gulfs because they got an overweight of treasuries. They don't know what to do with them all. And the Saudis made an announcement back in, I think it was August, that they're going to create a new sovereign wealth fund. And I heard inside word, it's to convert treasuries to gold. So Saudi is not going to be the U.S. Uh, partner anymore. They've already had their divorce. And the, the papers are not fully signed. And China will be witnessing the signing. I think the United States is going to work toward regime change in Saudi Arabia and hope to steer their favorite among the rival tribes, and I don't think they're going to succeed.
I wonder if it's going to be the Bin Laden tribe. <laughs> I don't know. I, I, don't, I don't know. Let's just leave it at that, okay? All right, Jim. Yes, we uh, regrettably we run out of time here or running out of time. So before we go, please uh, tell the listeners about your uh, website, your uh, hat trick letter, and uh, how they can subscribe to it. Sure. I'm the editor of the hat trick letter. It's, it now has ten and a half years. Uh, a month ago, I had order number 10,000, which really knocked me back. Wow. I, I have not held, I got some email afterwards saying, really, you're trying to tell me you got 10,000 subscribers, 10,000 active clients? I said, no. I had 10,000 orders. Now it's 10,200. But uh, I haven't kept them all. Some have come and gone. So I, it, it's, uh, it's about a quarter of that are active clients. And it's found on information on the newsletter and other related information and analysis is found on the goldenjackass.com, www.goldenjackass.com website. Uh, on that website, there's a main page. It, it's an it's a, a open domain, a free domain, no, public domain web page. It's called Main 5, only because it was the fifth, fifth version when making it. Um, so main5.html has the date of the posted report coming up. It has a number of uh, recent public articles and a number of recent interviews like this. The newsletter itself, started in April of 2004, has two different publications each month. It, it doesn't alternate. It's, it's two per month. One is the uh, Money War Report. Global Money War Report. It's for high-level battles, you know, like uh, the BRICS, the BRICS events, BRICS confrontations, um, a lot of different things like competitive currency activity, uh, like, like activity right now to suppress the commodities and suppress oil, lift up the dollar. We're, we're seeing a death event right now in the dollar. This is a death event identified by its rise. It sounds paradoxical. I've been calling for this for two to three years. It will rise and rise and rise, then die. Um, the U.S. government is going to be forced to, to print a new currency because the dollar is being rejected overseas. And although the Federal Reserve can cover, these are all things discuss, discussed in the Money War Report, because the Federal Reserve can cover the bonds being dumped, that's one thing. But they cannot force supplying nations of of all kinds of products that enter the U.S. as imports, they cannot force those nations to accept treasury bonds anymore. They're going to have to come up with something better, something more legitimate. And I think it's going to be a new dollar that I'm calling the Scheiss dollar, which is German for shit. So they're going to have a new Scheiss dollar that gets devaluated. These are the sort of things that will ensure the U.S. economy continues in its import supply. And notice all the outsourcing for the last 30 years that bankrupted the nation and put it dependent on foreign suppliers.